squat, squat, International rugby is such an odd beast. You spend three years plotting a tour, three months planning a win, three weeks training to play, and then it all slips away into embarrassment in 23 minutes. After a dominant first 15 this Saturday, Ireland fell to a calamitous result against a resurgent New Zealand, shutting mouths all over as they ripped up Jawbreaker Sex Vice's team. So, how did the All Blacks tear Ireland apart? And is there still hope for the Irish to be competitive in this series as it goes on to two more games? Not too long ago, the All Blacks left the rest of the world floundering, constantly panicking, trying to keep up. For eight years, whatever tactics the All Blacks adopted quickly became the trend in the rest of the world. And then, that changed. After a 12-month existential crisis leading into the Rugby World Cup, sending them into a kind of constant spin, New Zealand under Ian Foster have now spent the last two years doing what everyone else was doing three years ago, copying shapes and structures that have been made pretty much obsolete by improving defences. If we take a look at New Zealand's four games last year against the top three sides in the world, South Africa, France and Ireland, who also boast the best defences out there, this drive over by Ardi Surveyor from a five-metre line-out is about the only time New Zealand broke down the team themselves, collectively. The only try against a world-class defence to come from something other than a moment of individual magic by one of the handful of world-class players. New Zealand's attack has been entirely predictable, players usually only having one passing option open to them, and they've been super easy to smother, meaning their only hope of scoring is Bowden, Ardy or Will Jordan doing something sublime out of nowhere. This may net you enough tries to win a few games, but it's not a sustainable strategy. However, the All Blacks on Saturday found a way to make this work. Instead of trying to build boring patterns in the hope of their star players breaking them, New Zealand built patterns around their star players, but most namely, most obviously, one star player. Sneck Sneck Messiah for himself, Aaron Smith. Smith is probably the best passer of a rugby ball on the planet, and probably has been for near enough a decade, and the All Blacks this summer have contorted their entire game plan to get the most out of this fact. One of the most basic concepts in concocting a game plan is are you playing off 9 or are you playing off 10? Is the majority of your play coming from the scrum off spinning it to whoever carries, or is the 10 dropping off balls to players in more space? Playing off 9 allows you to play with more pace, off 10 more deception, it can both have equal advantages and disadvantages, it's just a decision that all coaches have to make. New Zealand on Saturday played an off 10 game plan structure shape the lot, but they played it off 9. I'll go through this more thoroughly in a moment, but in the lead up to Geordie Barrett's try, the All Blacks set up to play off 10 every phase, yet the fly half himself, Bowden Barrett, did not touch the ball even once. It all begins here. Gibson Park attempts to create real pressure on Smith's pass, but he can deliver it crisply to Tupaia, and the change from last autumn is already evident. As well as crashing in himself, Tupaia has two passing options here, and two further men in the wide channels, and it forces Ireland to kind of stand back and assess, not making a decision until he's made a decision. Ioani and a detaching Kane essentially form a pod of three on the fly, and even though Henshaw makes a really smart decision to try and hold him up. New Zealand can secure the ball pretty cleanly. Taylor is then stood in as the first receiver, but Smith skips him in order to use Surveyor. The ball out super fast then, allowing Smith to once again use his lightning fast pass to skip the first receiver, again hitting the other Barrett, who in turn hits Reese, which must make a nice change for him. He smashes into contact, and another nice change for him is the one brought to ground. The Barrett bros clear out, and having now got to an edge with only one forward committed, the All Blacks have a perfect chance to set their shape properly. George Bowers' line here is normally the kind of thing that only gets passed to in situations like like this, where a 10 is stood in and selects him as a runner in the most space. But instead, it's Smith who hits him, and not just because of the space. He clatters into Ryan and Porter, and it does a number on Ireland's defence. These are the last two big hitters before you get to ring roast and the 10-channel, who's organising the line, with Furlong outside him in the 12 shirt. This is extremely similar in concept to what Wales are doing here. Hardy feeds bigger, who hits his runner not because he's in space, but because he isn't. The ruck is now too far away for most English forwards to fold around and reach the other side, meaning that Wales can get on the outside and work it away down the wing. Except the All Blacks don't need a bigger figure to make the call. Smith him himself lobs a perfect wide ball out to Whitelock, forcing him to drift onto it, making it harder to hit as a defender. Furlong, not used to being in a position like this anyway, is so focused on these runners he doesn't acknowledge Whitelock as an option. They've skipped it entirely. The Ireland defence reacts quickly, but Whitelock reacts quicker, flipping it behind to Ioani, who draws Henshaw and allows the reshuffle to Paella to unleash Fiangra Nuku. If this play came off 10, there'll be two changes. One, Ireland have a split second longer to drift and react thanks to the extra pass being required, but two, New Zealand have to spread out wider. There's an extra dude in this space, so everyone shuffles along a step. And not only do Ireland have more time to drift, you have less space to cover. By playing off nine, New Zealand can reboot repeatedly, rapidly, until Smith spots the phase where they can isolate Ireland. The first few phases dragging ring rows into the middle of the pitch and exploiting the fact Henshaw is forced by the 12 roll in a 13 position, trying to make the key hit and manage the other defenders at once. Flying Anuku gets brought down inches short, but the All Black setup is inspired. As well as Smith himself, who Ireland will remember, loves the snipe, he's very very good at it as well. They have Retallic ready for a big carry, and then two backs come into a pod shape. But is he ever going to hit Bowie or Tubaia? 
Probably not, but their positioning means Ireland both have to watch them, and that Smith can pinpoint a pass between the two of them, shielding its trajectory while it hangs in the air. His passes are usually like bullets, but this one just lingers a last second, allowing Geordie Barrett to pick his angle onto it, exploiting Byrne being drawn in by Bowden and crashing over. Whilst the All Blacks have scored plenty of tries in the last few years from individuals doing outstanding things, using their outrageous skill to improve the phase shape and pattern shape is inspired in the most it should be obvious way possible. However, it isn't an entirely new idea. In fact, it's one Ireland fans should probably be pretty familiar with because it's taken straight from the brain of your old favourite uncle, Joe Schmidt. During his tenure with Ireland, the lad used to run off 10 plays through Conor Murray's insane accuracy. But the difference was, there, Murray was merely assessing and passing. Smith with the All Blacks is pretty much playing the entire 10 role. He's organising and restructuring, most importantly, instead of hitting runners and a basic pod structure as Murray was in 2018, New Zealand this weekend frequently operates a 2-4-2 pattern, which is essentially a really fiddly attacking structure designed to let everyone into play. But when we've seen it in the past in pro rugby, be it most famously with the Crusaders, but also like Wales' slightly forlorn attempts last autumn or England this, this weekend gone, it's been played off 10. Richie Mwanga, in particular for the Crusaders, loves to touch the ball constantly, everything slipping in now it's hands like a pickpocket made a lard, but New Zealand instead operates the off nines if you have never seen, and with success. The other interesting thing is how well they adapted the pod shape itself. Where forwards usually form an arrowhead shape, New Zealand instead placed them in a pretty flat line. However, this is perhaps where the All Blacks of old and new meet. Because instead of straight up stealing an idea from an opponent, Foster, Schmidt and Moore have innovated on somebody else's design. Last autumn, France's stretch formation, which I discussed in my video on their Grand Slam win, but also Connor of the Wibble Worldbury channel explains it in way more depth than I do in his video on them, caused New Zealand endless problems, leading to this try finished by Roman Untermack. But where France took with their backline, New Zealand iterated by using their pack. After a crash ball from Fayanuku, they set like this, a three-man pod in a diagonal line, then a gaggle of guys behind them. Smith, once again hits the furthest out runner, but Barrett calls the shape, and those three forwards behind the group form, last second, into a pod running a France-style stretch formation. They're all drifting and allow Surveyor to run a major overs line, whilst Ringrose is expecting just a simple trundle. He slides off the tackle and the sheer support, also stretching around the corner, forces Earls to come round and allow Surveyor to step in and score. All of this is coming back once again to the sheer quality of Aaron Smith's pass, upping the pace and space of what's possible. And whilst the focus on the pass itself probably explains Finlay Christie being preferred to TJ Perinara, we do also have evidence that it can work with anyone at nine. Smith here is tied in the ruck, but the first receiver is once again skipped to draw the central defender, this guy leading the line, up to hit Barrett so he can slide in this kick. This is off turnover balls, so and the backfield isn't properly set, but the Irish main line is. Andy Farrell always likes to have his main defender turn and cover kicks, allowing him to use a scrum off in the main defensive line, rather than as a sweeper. And so Barrett knows, by being stood a little wider here, he can cause the most aggressive unit in the Irish defence to fixate on him, opening up acres of space behind. It's incredibly impressive and exciting to see New Zealand breathe new life into their attack. However, I will say, whilst these innovations would have caught any side off guard once, now we've seen them, I do wonder if New Zealand are going to have to keep innovating and iterating. Or is this kind of Foster done for the season? He's done his little innovation, is he, is, he, is, he, is he happy now? Because now I know what's coming and have a week to prep, I can see them starting to shut this down pretty well in the second test. And they showed in the game's opening 20 minutes that they can dominate them. This is a lovely piece of play by Jameson Gibson Park, trying to exploit the All Black mindset. He slams it long to isolate Jordy Barrett knowing he'll get there first, but with enough pressure on him, he'll be forced to run. Now, typically from just outside their own 22, the All Blacks kick shallow to contest, but with a back three as excellent as theirs in the air, if Barrett takes this in, Ireland will probably be confident of regaining the ball from that kick, with a roughly 20 metre net gain. Or, if Barrett then runs this, as he does, he has to run away from his support, isolating himself. Now, I firmly believe that inside Peter Amani are two wolves. One jagged old warhorse who trundled up to furiously make 86 tackles a week motivated by the sheer palpable anger he still feels in the one time he was a child, and an old man in the county court park tricked him into picking up a dog poo, and the other, a superstar for GM7's player who occasionally emerged from out of the old jackal head's shadow. And here, we get a rare treat, as we see both of them share the body at once. Barry isolated, Omani swoops in, blows Smith off the ball, and spots the space in behind, dropping onto his boot and almost creating a drive for Keith Hills. A man who's still too scared to admit he was the old guy of the dog poo. However, there was nothing dog shit. <laughs> I get paid for this. About the way he finished the opening try that had so many of us writing an all-black eulogy far, far too early. Just as Aaron Smith is key to how the All Blacks play, so much of what Ireland do with the ball is down to the sheer speed of service provided by Gibson Park. His instincts are sharp, 
Here, Smith calls for support and Gibson Park goes, oh yeah, thanks, and exploits the space that is open. Sheehan breaks off, but a tap means he can't get the pass away, and from there, Ireland play with just incredible pace and accuracy. They play 18 phases over the sequence, and in only four of them, does the ball take longer than 2.5 seconds to emerge from the ruck? And that includes Sam Kane here being penalised for slowing it down, for just being a pest. This sheer speed of ball is vital, but so is the decision making. As we can see from this clip after the 11th phase, 14 of 15 Irish players are spread across the third of the pitch, and eight of them inside the 50 metre line. They're all stood within like 12 metres of each other. And inside two seconds, the ball could realistically be in any of those eight hands. And so the All Blacks drop a hefty eight players on that blind side in response. And then, as play rolls on and Ireland start to work it back to the other side, the same heavy concentration of All Blacks remains the same. They condense around the ruck. And after this drop off to Henshaw, a huge rush of defenders flood blind side. Ten All Blacks are here within 15 metres of this ruck. They're all flooding to wherever Ireland carry. So Gibson Park looks open, but with the All Blacks set, he instead skips it back the way they came. Outside all the four was going up inside 10 meters. Sheehan can almost slip outside Seve Reese, but he brings him to ground and Ireland can play quickly again. Now, if we just rewind, let's keep an eye on Quinn Tupaye in the 12 jersey, the man who organises and leads the All Blacks line. After making this tackle, he gets back up to his feet and instantly sprints to the far side of the ruck, setting him in position to take burn. But when Ireland go against the grain, he sprints in the opposite direction to the cover of the wing. He stays there, and he settles on this side in his usual centre position. This leaves Lester Fainanuku, a debutant winger, defending the crucial 12 position where Ireland are sending all their backs. Ioane starts really tied to him, and whilst they can blow off Henshaw's dummy line, it's enough of a distraction to open up a weak gap for Ring Rose to throw something Fainanuku could never have seen coming through. Keenan starts all the way over here and tracks across and only hits the line at the last second, allowing him to hit this space and draw both All Blacks tacklers. Now, Geordie Barrett could stop Hills, but he's caught ball watching and it allows Ultra Onion to step him and finish brilliantly to put Ireland in for what was ultimately temporary control of the test match. There will be fewer surprises for Ireland to deal with as we head into the second test of the weekend, but their all-round drop in intensity and control when Jellycake's ex-pong left the field was alarming. So much of Ireland's play is structured, organised and re-re-re-rehearsed, and then just called and deployed by sex lead. And I don't know whether Carberry simply hasn't had the same amount of time with the playbook to be as instinctive on it as Jubbly Time Sex Quest, and that split seconds difference is night and day when up against the world-class opposition, unable to just get things started in the first place. And so another week might be exactly what they need. Saturday was embarrassing, but Ireland are by no means out of this series. A first ever win on New Zealand soil on Saturday remains a real possibility. Even in the infamous 60-0 tour, this second test saw Ireland only lose to a late drop goal by Dan Carter. Things may not have gone as Ireland would have wanted, but those three years of planning, three months of plotting, and three weeks of training may not be in vain just yet. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we have... Australia against England coming tomorrow, that's the plan anyway, hopefully. Uh, then Wales v South Africa on the Friday. I've just been trying to whiz through these. There are three games we're talking about, so three games I'm talking about. A lot to get done this week. Very, very busy week. I hope you enjoyed that. And without further ado, I'm going to get uh, back to it. There's loads of one chance we'll have a poke around. There's a podcast as well covering the 1911 World Cup. There's loads of, loads of stuff, and I'll see you very soon for Australia against Angleterre. Thank you very much for talking to us. Go well next week, and I look forward to it. Cheers. Peace.